This is getting started with great ball contraption, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, starting off with why you can listen to me. I've done this for a long time, and I've watched lots of people get good at it, so maybe I can help you too. There's more reasons, but mostly it's because I'm passionate about it. I think ball contraption is a lot of fun, and I think at least a third of you will have fun doing it. The rest of you will just get frustrated and bounce off, but that's still fine. Um, what is a ball contraption? It's, you know, the, ball, the things that constantly move and reduce your Lego gears to dust. There are things to, you know, learn how to use gears and so on without having a car that drives against the wall of your apartment and crashes and then you're done. Uh, it's a device to move balls from a hopper to a hopper. You've seen them downstairs. You probably have seen a ball contraption on YouTube if you're showing up for this talk, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, but it's, it's one of the little sub things and it's very mechanical. Uh, if I was cool with PowerPoint, I'd have a slide here with a video and stuff, but the formal standard. So the way that ball contraption works for everybody is that there is a standard, and because we all use the same standard, we can all show up at a convention and have things just link up together. For the linkages to happen, we have to follow the standard. The input hopper is the first 10 bricks high, 10 studs wide, at least, well, at least 10 studs wide, at least 10 studs deep. That's, that's a hopper. All right, you can be wider than that, you can be longer than that, there's reasons for that, it's useful. And then some way of moving from balls from one section to the next section. Like we were joking earlier, if you had a hopper, I would recommend doing those two hoppers. Balls come into your hopper, and every once in a while you take the empty hopper and replace it with the full hopper, and walk, and dump out the next hopper. That is a legal ball contraption. It is not one I will operate for you while you go to the bathroom. If you bring that ball contraption to anything that I'm at, or I'm a theme coordinator for, you will be there all day moving from hopper to hopper, but that is legal. It's some method of moving balls from your input hopper to the next person's output hopper. Anything you want to do between there is legal. Um, there are fully extra details. You should be able to handle, you should accept up to pulses of 30 balls over 30 seconds, and you should out ball, output 30 balls over 30 seconds yourself. So that's the formal standard. We have a couple of extra ways of writing that up on signs down around the uh, contraption, this, this convention. In practice, in real life, very few conventions run one ball per second persistently. So if you are not reaching one ball per second, you're, you know, three quarters of a ball per second, we might still like you. There are, if you're dead reliable at, you know, three quarters of a ball per second, that's probably fine. Pulses are much more likely to be five or 10 balls. There are folks who have attempted to build modules that do exactly 30 balls in an output every 30 seconds just to be persnickety. But in practice, if you have a problem with a 30 ball surge, we can put somebody upstream of you who will give you one ball per second. They will already broken up the surges. We're much more happy, or I as a theme coordinator, are much more happy to have more people participating than saying, oh no, you're not to standard, we're not gonna include you. I don't know if any member, several years ago, Thomas Mueller used to come to place to conventions and bring six foot tall ball contraptions that would bring things up. Let's, you know, he had to stop building because the ceilings were too low. That weren't technically legal. His hoppers were illegal. His output rates were not always correct. But they're visual spectacle. Of course we're gonna make that work. We have ways of getting around that. Sub loops, like we don't all have to contain. We can have a small section where it's just, you know, Alex's stuff is working, so we'll let Alex self circulate while Kevin's stuff gets worked on things like that. When you are doing your designs at home, definitely the input hopper is non-negotiable, 10 bricks high. I strongly recommend, if you're coming up with your own designs, output at 12 bricks high. Just a little bit of a drop, but that lets you put a ramp in later so you can actually do some testing. It gives us some safety factors when you're trying to connect modules together. If you're coming out exactly at 10, and their hopper is exactly at 10, and then, oh, someone put a plate or a tile somewhere, or they've got a base plate, or even the table isn't level, exactly at 10 can be more challenging. So push out over 10. So now we're talking about the dream module, the ideal module. I've never built one of these, but these are all things you can think about in ways of, you know, you've built something, you're excited about it, how can you make it better? Never fails, this is the most important one. The best way to employ ball contraption is to have something that works so well, we won't believe you when you show up, but you could show up, walk away from it, and never have it be there. Reliability is the key. If something goes wrong one time in a hundred, that's every two minutes. If something goes wrong one time in a thousand at one ball per second, four times an hour. 
So if you have a thing that works just fine for a little bit, you have not tested it. You are not reliable, you don't, you're not confident. If you show up and drop something off at the table because you're sure it's reliable, people are gonna make faces at you if you're nice. I mean, that, that's the best case scenario. We're not gonna believe you. After two hours of the show when you've been running just solidly, then maybe we'll be happy to say, oh, yeah, go out and get lunch, this is fine. We'll got, you know, someone will watch this for you. But reliability is the most important thing ever. No jams, no spilling, no balls resting someplace, although that one's much less of a problem. It should be beautiful, original, and displayed for the first time because we're asking for the ideal module. So every time you come back to BrickCon, I want a new, perfectly functioning, original module, brand new mechanism, all of that. Has an understandable mechanism that everyone who sees it can understand and be happy with. From a three-year-old to the you know, PhD in engineering who shows up here. Uh, runs at exactly at one ball per second, but you can toggle the rate. Isn't that handy? Oh no, someone downstream of you is having a problem. You need to speed up, slow down. It's ideal if you can do this. It's not required. The standard is one ball per second. But if you can do better than that, then you know, do better than that. Um, handles pulses, yeah, handles pulses larger than 30 balls. We're required to accept up to 30 balls. But if you can handle 200, that's really useful. We can take a very full hopper because someone's had a problem up down or somewhere else in the loop, dump that whole thing into your module, and then you'll just start feeding them out and we're done. More than 30 is a feature. No one's gonna complain if you have a 200 ball hopper. Um, can easily convert into a recycling, a recirculating loop. If you can say, oh look, Kevin's downstream of me and Kevin's stuff is broken again. Rather than have to shut down everything, if you can just flip a switch on your module or turn a lever or adjust a nozzle and suddenly you're circulating the balls, so all the balls that are flowing through are catching up with you but your hopper holds 200 because you know you're awesome with this brand new, totally reliable module. If you can start recirculating and holding the balls, you'll be really happy. I mean, we'll be happy to have you in the loop. Um, delivers balls, you know, receives balls without bouncing or spillage. If you can somehow have some way of dampening, because you know, someone's clever, like uh, Neil has this nice little high drop that's dropping things out. Maybe someone's, le technically it's legal to drop balls from six feet above the table and claim you're gonna consistently hit that 10 by 10 hopper. If your hopper is 10 bricks high, solid brick, Something's gonna fall from three feet and bounce out. Suck all the energy, put them on springs or dampers, whatever you want. If you, could, you know, your hopper should never let anything bounce back out of it. Uh, where's the, where are we at there? Yeah, when you're pushing balls out, they should have zero energy when they hit the incoming hopper. Don't be the three foot drop guy. Be someone who just barely drops the balls in. There's no extra energy. They're not shooting all over the place. Uh, and can you have an adjustable output uh, ramp? Can you hand me the blue one again? So this is a very simple conveyor belt. It's got a nozzle, but because Neil is clever, you can put extra axles here and suddenly it's longer. So the crappy module that I put right here beforehand that broke and we had to pull out of the loop, Neil's like, no problem, dude. I'm longer now, I can adjust for these problems. So we can pull things out of the loop for field repairs or you know, cursing out or whatever you wanna do. If someone else's module can just stretch out that's fantastic. And you know, Neil's got all these little adjustable things. I just love this to death, Neil. The hopper is accessible from three sides. By the standard, you only have to be flat coming on this side. You no, know, we're pushing through. If you can come in from all the sides, you're good for corners. Corners are good. They ha you'll, you'll notice downstairs we're in a square. Anyway, being able to feed in from all sides is better than being able to feed in from one side. It's not required, but we're talking about the ideal, not the minimum. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a gentleman's C, but go strive for A pluses, at least some of you should. Let's hold them to the end, please. Uh, three sides, oh yeah, and it's hard to break. Should be sturdy and easy to transport. And of course, the dream for everybody, quiet. GBC is, I think, the loudest, well, no, I think Kid Brick is louder than we are. But there's all the motors running, there's balls bouncing, it's, if you made a quiet module, if we could tell, we'd be very happy with you. So. Like I said, I've never built the ideal module. Do not let this be the, don't let the perfect or the ideal be the enemy of the good. If your first module doesn't do these things, that's fine. The things you have to do, well, honestly, the things you have to do are, in theory, you, you kind of like show up with something that mostly works and we will try to accommodate you. But once you are, you know, striving to do better, we want the ideal. Just some little discussion about what the anatomy is. We have a previous module. We've got a hopper section.
We've got an agitator so that when your balls are in your hopper, you'd be surprised how sturdy of a bridge round things can be made, used to make. The balls aren't perfectly round and they aren't perfectly smooth, so there's, you can build an archway of four balls pretty easily. So having something that stirs your hopper, knocks the balls into each other so they'll have more of a tendency to fall, isn't required, but once again, is a feature. It keeps you from, it helps you keep you reliable. The mechanism, the miracle occurs. The conveyor belt, the person who's willing to sit there all day, a pump, uh, turning, all sorts of different things. And then delivery, your output nozzle. That's the thing that could be adjustable or not. Right into the next one. These are the sort of the terms that I like to use when I'm discussing ball contraption stuff. Now you want to get started. So the parts you're going to want for a ball contraption. Um, these are no longer, this, this slide is a bit dated because all this stuff is even more out of print or even older now. The power, I, what I'm going to say right off is you don't want a battery box. Batteries, the power goes down as, the, as they get older and then that turns your motors at different speeds. So you can imagine if you ran this at 10x the speed it's supposed to be, it's not a conveyor belt, it's a conveyor flinger. The, very, the, the second ball contraption I ever built was, you know, it involved a turning mechanism. When I finally got it working just right, I put, the battery, put new batteries in it and I had built the ball flinger. So if you're not running off of wall power, you know, it's theoretically possible, but you have made your life that much more difficult. Uh, you want something that you can plug into the wall. So the old nine volt train controllers are ideal. They plug into the wall, you can tune the power as much as you like. But once again, they've been out of print since 07. So I'm trying to figure if there's anyone here young enough that before they were born, but probably not quite there yet. But the train controllers are harder to get. They're getting more expensive every year. Um, but, and then if we do get the train controller, you need a magic converter wire. As exists now, there's the power up stuff. I haven't actually worked with any yet. There's mind storms. There's lot, there are other alternatives. There's Chinese knockoffs. Um, I'm not going to tell you not to use Lego pieces, but these things do exist. Uh, balls. You, you obviously need some Lego soccer balls. I once again won't say that you, need, that you should go off and buy the knockoff almost balls, but they're a lot cheaper yet. I mean, these are still available at BrickLink. They're back in print on and off. I think you're all allowed to know about bulk lug as a thing. You can get a bulk lug, or if you can convince your lug to include this as one of your pieces for bulk lug, you can get a lot of them, and you probably should, because the minimum I'm going to recommend you start with is 30, so you can test your pulses. 300 is not a bad number. Um, most of the conventions in the Pacific Northwest, the convention will supply balls for you, so you don't have to bring those with you. You don't have to have a huge supply of balls. But for testing at home, the convention is much less useful to you. Uh, so yeah, you need some way of powering your module. You need a collection of balls. There are third-party solutions now if you don't want to pay for the outer print parts. And I won't judge you. I'm not sure other folks won't judge you, but I won't judge you. I think it's more important that we're playing than we're remaining pure. So how do you get started with the ball contraption? Now we've talked about what ball contraptions are. How do you actually get started? Starting off with an idea is, you know, what is where is your source of ideas? Nowadays, like for the past five years, you don't really like that much an idea. You have to decide you want to do this. There are lots of places, yeah, and I will publish all these slides later. You can take the photos or not. There are lots of websites like The Great Ball Contraption, Rebrickable, Planet GBC, all sorts of places where folks will have flat out instructions with parts list. It's not, I think actually, one of the sites in China actually puts together as a kit for you right now. Can't guarantee the quality or anything else, but you, starting off has, no, has never been easier. You can decide you want, uh, start with the kit. There's convention models where those are all published. I did a convention model at Bricks Cascade a few years ago that was designed to be with parts that everyone, I'm not going to guarantee that all of you have these Lego at home, but you probably do. And if not, you could leave this building with them at this convention. The, the parts you don't have are easy to. You can go onto YouTube. You can look at the world around you. There's just lots of ways to get ideas to start on ball contraption. I mean, I, the cranes at the harbor. I mean, from Bellevue, you don't see the harbor as much as we would have in the other location, but I have built ball contraptions inspired by cargo ship loading containers. Like, I could, look at that, that's moving. I could turn that into a ball contraption. Um, yeah, and then my attempt to make a clever acronym, you're gonna come up with the idea, you're gonna try to build it. You're gonna look at it and test it. You're gonna review it, and it's not gonna work. You're gonna have problems. You're gonna run it for 10 minutes, and it's gonna explode, it's gonna spill. Figure out what went wrong, improve it, and go back to start. Even if you just got it from a direction kit and you put it together exactly according to the directions, you're gonna start running it and it's not gonna work right. 
Anyone who brings a working ball contraption has built a ball contraption. Doesn't matter if it's someone else's directions or anything else, actually getting it to work. I, I can know John will testify with me. He has built a lot of things from other folks' directions and then spent a lot of hours getting them work up to a standard that he's satisfied with. And that's even before he makes it pretty. Nothing ever works. I, this, I, I don't mean to depress you. But nothing will ever work. And if you've tested it for two hours, you know what you don't know? You don't know how well it runs after it's run for two hours. So that after you've run it for four hours, you don't know how well it runs after it runs for four hours. So you can never do too much testing. You will always be dealing with it. So don't feel bad if you run it for 20 minutes and it explodes in a way you've never seen before. You are not a unique failure. You are now just one of us. The, if you're not, you're gonna be owning iteration. The, solar, the, score, the core part of ball contraption is you have an idea, you're excited about it, you get it working mostly. And then you get more and more to your mostly as time goes by. And then it's so cool when you actually do get to the four hour mark. You're like, you know, like I usually hit my groove Sunday late morning. So Saturday is stressful. And then on a good convention show for me, after it's been running for six hours, finally I'm like, I'm gonna sit down. I'm not gonna actually read my book, but I can like listen to a podcast or something. You can just sort of look around and see that nothing's broken. Look around, oh, something's broken over there. That's not mine. Someone on it? Oh good, they are. I'll just keep sitting here. But that's, you know, I have been doing this for 10 years, so don't count on sitting down a lot your first couple of years, depending on how ambitious you are. When you are learning, to, these are the things that I've learned about decreasing my cycle time, shall we say. Put a motor on it as soon as you can. You've got this mechanism sort of working, it's kind of moving, put the motor on. Turning it by hand is very easy to cheat yourself, because you can, you know, oh, it's a little draggy here, I can push harder and make it work, or, you can see when things start going wrong and consciously or not change the rate, or even just your hand doesn't move as fast as a motor. So things that work perfectly well at one RPM might not work at 200 RPM. So I, I strongly encourage you, get your motor, get your mechanism set up, and even before it's ready to move balls, see that it's working, see that your, chain, your belts are connected, your gears are all working together, because it's much easier to fix it the sooner you catch the problem. Um, but being able to hand crank it is also useful. As I was describing earlier, you turn it up to a motor and you can see that it's pulsing, it's throbbing, what's going wrong there? But at 200 RPM, it's hard to see at what point of the process is there a problem. If you can turn it by hand, pop the motor off and turn a crank, or if you're super cool, use a differential so you can put the power in from two different ways, that's an advanced lesson. Um, then you can sort of feel, oh, it's tight here. Why is it tight here? Oh, it's tight here because these pieces are rubbing. You wouldn't have seen that at full speed but being able to hand crank is really useful. Uh, clutch power is weak. If you're, if you're entirely brick build your ball contraption, actually Alex, will you pass me the push arm there? This is an almost entirely brick built ball contraption. There's directions for it online. I did a kit for this at Bricks Cascade a few years ago. You own these pieces. Anyone who walks out or doesn't go home and build one of these things first thing Monday, this is on you. However, even this mostly brick built one does have a Technic lift arm holding the drive chain together because gently vibrating Lego and pushing them apart softly is a great way to separate bricks. So if this was a purely brick built operation, it would last from like maybe two minutes before all of these gears would push the things holding together, then the gears wouldn't be in contact and they'd be happy free flowing and it wouldn't be a ball contraption. So you can't just put it with the, uh, I don't, I recommend not just putting it with studs, you know, just studs on top connections. Connecting sections, yeah, at any time you have a flexible section connection, like I've stopped using base plates as my connections because you haven't bricked it up entirely, it'll bend a little bit. And a little bit of bend is plenty to make things not work right. And more insidiously, work right at home and not work right after you've transported it somewhere. Because that's gonna happen. You're gonna put it in a, it's gonna work fine on your test bench. You're gonna take it to a convention. You're gonna take it out of the box and put it on the table and something new is gonna go wrong. You want to minimize the number of those somethings. Uh, connect the sections. If you, if you make your modules beautiful, I encourage that. But make sure you can still access the mechanism. Balls will get places that you didn't think they could get. Many of those places block your mechanism. Put a hinge on the, you know, you have this beautiful alpine wall of a mountainside with skiers. 
Make it a hinge so you can open up and get what's inside there. Because you can, it's Lego, you could take it apart and get there. If you're doing that, when there are literally 100 people watching you, and it's, you know, you've already broken three things that day, and you're tired, and you're, just put a hinge. I'll tell you right now, include in your design, put a hinge there. You'll be, in the future, you will be very happy about it. Um, be aware of what happens when the power gets turned on the wrong way. The train controllers go both ways. You can, you know, forward voltage, backwards voltage. I put little bricks on mine so you can't turn them the wrong way, but I'm aware for most of my modules what happens if you do turn them the wrong way, because it's bad. Um, but you should be aware that if your module gets run backwards, like conveyor belts, they're a great example. You can see there's these little pins, and the bottom of the hopper is flat. So if you put a ball between the pins and the bottom of the hopper and you run the conveyor belt backwards, you're gonna have pins going places you didn't want pins to go. Because, or you're gonna burn out your motor or both. So ball or, uh, conveyor belts running backward, bad. It, it's okay, conveyor belts are great modules. But there are things you can do. You can build in slip gears. Do I have one on here? Yes. So the clutch gears, and the clutch, there's a new clutch gear connection piece, but I have this little white, is that a 20 tooth, 24, it doesn't matter. 24 tooth gear. If it, there's a jam, that gear will just not transmit torque through it. It'll start grinding in a, you know, a few million iterations or whatever else, it's gonna never transmit torque again. But in the meantime, it's saving my motor, or your motor, or somebody's motor. Uh, so be aware that sometimes there's gonna be a jam, sometimes people are gonna be helpful and turn on power in ways that you didn't want power turned on. And if that's gonna kill your model, perhaps be a little defensive about it. Because you know, ball contraption is a team event, like I was saying earlier. Right now we have 10 builders, I think we got a count of 10 builders and 50 modules. No one person's gonna be there the whole time. Sometimes someone's gonna be babysitting your thing, or they're even not, you're gonna be there, and you'll have a problem in your first module, and you're looking at it, and then something goes slightly wrong in your other module, and somebody, maybe me, is gonna try to help. And imagine I'm an idiot. It, it's a giant leap for most of you, I'm sure. But I'm trying to help, and I'm gonna do something that's even worse that you know not to do because you built this thing. Try to make it, idiot, idiot proof is not even on the ideal list. Idiot resistant is the goal. If something, what are the obvious things that go wrong? Is the power gonna go backwards? Is the ball gonna get stuck here? How to make that not be explosively frustrating? And on that same note, yeah, we talked about having an agitator to stir up the balls, a testing jig. So what are the great advantages of coming out at more than 10 bricks high, like with this little hopper or this little conveyor belt? You can easily build a ramp that go, you know, a little thing that catches the balls and pushes them off to here, or I would push off to this side over here, and then drop them back in your hopper. And you can work on just this module on your bench. All the problems that you're getting are with this module or your ramp. But, I mean, Ramp problems happen all the time. You don't have to worry about that so much. Your ramp spills. That's not what you're gonna use in the show, but you can figure out what's going wrong with this module by testing in place. And that's another reason to have the um, output 12 bricks high or 13 bricks or high or 15 bricks high. Like, I don't really recommend 24 bricks high unless you build a cool downslope ramp, which people love. Talk about that later. But being able to build a testing jig to test just your module without having to get other things in process. Because if I were to try to test this module and this module, and then I notice on the table that five balls have spilled. Which of these ones is the problem? I mean, I know the answer, it's this one. But uh, that's because I have a lot of faith in Neil and this is a solid, and I, I have a lot of not faith in that. But uh, yes, so these are all ways to make your building experience closing up that loop. There are a lot of problems that you will catch earlier before they have frustrated you a lot. And then you can move on past them to the new and interesting problems. And then you can come talk to a great ball contraption. You come to the, one of the great things about the teamwork of ball contraption is you can pull up one of the modules from under the table that is not ready for prime time. Say, look, I've got this conveyor belt, but every Thursday it launches things and hits somebody in the eye. Do you guys have any idea why this is happening? And why is it only on Thursdays? And there's a good chance that someone at the table has tried to build one of these things and like, huh. That only happened to me on Wednesdays. But I see you're using gray pieces where I used yellow pieces, so I bet that's it. But having someone else who can talk to you about it is helpful too, but I couldn't, that was not my experience. I started Ball Contraption in 2006. No one else was still, do I started it after it was new, but before it was more commonplace. So I had a lot of um, self-discovery that I would rather you avoid it. <laughs>
Uh, like I said, being able to hand crank, did I cover all of that? Pretty much, yes. Being able to disengage the motor easily. Um, like a very exposed motor is often handy because sometimes things go wrong with motors, being able to pop them out and replace them is easy. And also with this motor, you can then pop it out. You can imagine I could then put a gear on it and turn it by hand. It's accessible enough. Um, the other option is having exposed gears and being strong, but that, I'm, I don't think it's actually bad to treat your motor like a generator, but I don't recommend it. Uh, so yes, being able to hand crank helps you diagnose problems. It's a, it's a design feature, but it's not even on the list of things for the ideal module, because that's something you should have worried about at home. Once you bring it to the convention, unless we're in the degenerate case where you want to sit there all day and be the source of power, which we really don't recommend. Um, oh yes, and here's the other visual part. When we're talking about snot being bad, or excuse me, clutch power not being sufficient for ball contraption, you can still build your ball contraptions out of bricks. You just need to reinforce them. This is probably old news for many of you, but lift arms, can you, there's that other pouch. Yep. Uh, split this bag and start circulating them in opposite directions. You can reinforce using the Technic bricks, the bricks with the little pinholes in them. You can reinforce those with lift arms, and then they don't separate. Lift arms are really strong under tension. You can use snot. You can get those little jump, or the bracket pieces is what I call them at least. I don't know what brick links. Anyway, and then you use brackets with a plate. Suddenly you've got extra reinforcement in a way that is transverse to the load. You have to break the Lego piece to make this thing separate. So you know, brick built can be lovely, and then you reinforce it, and then it will run for hours. Um, and I said, because you're gonna run it for hours. Even the parts that aren't under tension. When I run this bad boy at a show, like these parts aren't under load. I still go around regularly and just squeeze them down because that's vibrating all day long without my thumbs on it. Oh, there we go. It'll come around. Right, we're just circulating the rows, so it should get to you eventually. Um, yeah, so reinforce your, stu your studs only connections. Like this ties into what I was talking about earlier design for maintenance. It's going to go wrong. A long, narrow tunnel that you cannot access with balls, I guarantee you there will be a ball jam in there. I don't know how it will happen, but it will happen, and then you'll have to tear the whole thing apart. And then, you know, unless you're a really patient person, that will make you sad. Uh, access panels and things, a reset lever, agitators that move things around, even just a place where you could stick in an axle to move things along when they do get stuck. It's terrible for diagnosing, but at least at a show, you're making the balls move again, and if it only happens twice an hour, and you're gonna be there, and then you can tell people, oh, by the way, I'm gonna have lunch. If this stops flowing, poke it here. Not a great instruction, but it works. Testing jig, we talked about these earlier. Ooh, I didn't bring, there's the Technic panel, five by 11 by one. We've had these in our, they are so good for building ramps all the time. There's an excellent chance if you come by the ball contraption table sometime this weekend, you will see what used to be a module replaced out with a ramp made out of these panels. Um, they're reasonably flat. They go together in reasonable lengths quite quickly. I am hugely fond of those for jigs. Bricks on their side are also a really good way to build ramps. I used to do it that way. Alex still does. He's wrong now. <laughs> but um, it's very easy to get a nice long stretch of you know, one by eight bricks. Then you can build little plates on the side so you've got a channel. Those will go wrong and they're quite rigid. And then, yeah, there is no substitute for testing. Run things as long as you can, you know. The ideal case is like you're listening to watching TV on headphones, put it on your test bench, have it just running while you can sort of tune it out and come back and see there's those problems. Even more ideal is you're paying attention so that you came back and realize, oh my God, it's broken itself. I didn't watch it happen, but now you know it will break itself in the time it takes you to watch an episode of whatever you were watching. But, you know, if you've only tested it for five minutes, you are not show ready. I mean, you could come to a show and ask for a consultation, but don't register that for a show if it's only run at home for you successfully for 10 minutes. And if it ran for 10 minutes and you had three problems, really don't bring it to run at the show. So now we're getting to some fancy things for folks who are too cheap to buy a lot of motors. Shared power. So in theory, you don't need to have a motor for every module. In old uh, 
mills when steam power was still new, they would have a common drive shaft run through the plant and everyone else would have belts and pulleys to come through. So this module here, you can see this long axle down the side, that could connect to other axles. And I have an example down here that I can show after the talk of what would drive this. But this axle transmits power to this push arm module. I'll sort of demonstrate here how this works. The arm goes up, pushes the balls out, falls down, pushes more balls out. There's a lot of things wrong with this, but it just comes off the single power shaft. We did the kit in Cascade for this a couple years ago, and in theory, they could all just come from the kit, go on one motor at the end, and push through. I have a particular design for this shared power standard where it has this right here, and if you build to that standard and you come to a convention where I'm at, I'll be happy to power your module. Um, I don't know how you did it at home if you didn't have power, but whatever, I'm happy to bring it. Maybe the motor you, you have you put over somewhere else on the function table that's driving a cool looking windmill or something. But now I am not the only standard. There's lots of flaws with this standard. The location isn't aesthetically pleasing in many ways. Perhaps my RPM isn't good for you, um, whatever else. But on the internet now, because everything is on the internet and some of it isn't pornography, um, there are a few other folks who have come up with their own shared power systems that you could look into doing or come up with your own. These aren't, you know, maybe you have a better answer and four years from now I'll be using yours because I've burned out all my power standard modules. But don't be daunted after you build your first module and you haven't bought another motor yet to say, oh, I'm done. No, you don't have to be done. I mean, you should be committed, but you don't have to be done. So yeah, this is the little module. This is the power standard that you know, Alex and I, and I don't know if anyone else, Josh does it too now. Did you, have you done this? Yeah, and then you got smart. Um, but what's cool about this mechanism, and I forgot to steal Neil's laser pointer, is that the way those two gears are nested is a kind of clutch. If you run this the wrong way, which we were talking about earlier, it just turns off, or the gears just bounce open and no power is transmitted. Which is really important, because you, like I was talking earlier about conveyor belts, run conveyor belts the wrong way. Imagine you have a chain of eight things and one of them is a conveyor belt, and suddenly you turn it on in the wrong direction. I mean, this one just doesn't work run backwards, that's fine. But the uh, conveyor belt's it's catastrophic, so that's how we prevent it from happening. Alex's idea, so get clever friends, that's also one of my suggestions. At the show, this is sort of an etiquette question as opposed to exactly ball contraption, and if you just want to do ball contraption in your house and never show anyone, you can skip this slide. But that, I think the people in ball contraption are at least a third of the fun, probably not more than three quarters, but at least a third. Um, talk to your CO coordinator, tell them what you're bringing, uh, show off you know, how much space do you need, make sure you're there to do your setup. This, do a walkthrough of the whole loop before the show. This is something I've only been able to do a couple of times and it's been amazingly helpful. Because once again, you're gonna wanna go out and eat lunch or maybe go to the bathroom, whatever those silly biological needs you have. You're gonna abandon your modules. And the thing that you know how to fix with just a tap of your finger, because it happens three times in the eight hours of testing you did, right? Because we're all testing for eight hours, uh, at least. We don't know that. We don't know we can just tap it. So instead, we're gonna do something more drastic that seemed like a good idea at the time. And you're gonna come back and your contraption is not gonna look like you recognized it. Having had a chance to go around and talk to people and say, no, the immediate action when it starts making the growling noise is to shut down power in the building and leave. Uh, we need to know that before we all start babysitting your machine. So as a theme coordinator, we're, we're still working on getting better. The other advantage of the walkthrough is that we're not an exclusive tribe, but we understand your pain. There are many folks who have only ever built castle, and castle is beautiful. You set up a castle and you walk away, and it doesn't grind itself to paste. They don't understand us. We understand your pain. When you talk about, I was building on this, and you know, it took me three hours, and I solved this problem here, and this part's really cool. None of this particular module is really cool. Um, but you can show off something that's really cool to people who understand you, and that's very satisfying, I think. Um, help manage the loop during the show. We actually have a sign-up sheet for that this time, so that's pretty cool. I don't know if we've actually looked at it, but we have a sheet. Um, so plan on, if you do bring a ball contraption to the show, Plan on spending some time behind the table, both managing your module and helping other folks so they can be biological creatures as well. It's a social, I mean, 
Obviously, the whole point of your being there is so that they can leave. That's a weird kind of social, but you will almost never be alone behind the loop. Having done that when it was just me and my wife running the, the ball contraption, that was really stressful, even if it was just my modules. But uh, yes, you won't be alone, but other, you'll be able to help other people out. Uh, yes, have a plan for what to do when something breaks. I have a plan for you if you come to BrickCon. I have ramps that I'm going to have built for you. We can put together a ramp pretty quickly. But if you have your own plan, a few years ago, I don't know if, well, anyway, there was a magnificent first time GBC was the GBC Tower. He incorporated, I think, was six Akiyuki modules, super complicated, gazillions of pieces, six feet tall, magnificent. He had a bypass ramp with a simple stepper to get there. Is that the first year that, anyway, he either learned or was aware that he could do this. So when something exciting went wrong three feet in the air, he flipped a switch, and suddenly everything went super simply in front of him. Have great ambitions, but also be grounded. Something's going to go wrong, and you don't want to have everybody looking at you as being that guy who stopped the whole loop, who made someone have to take a hopper and run around your module to unload while you're having this problem. It's so much more fun when you have a problem to say, oh, that's busted, plonk, or flip a switch, or whatever else. Just makes your life so much easier. So having a plan for things are going to go wrong, I, I, it, like I said. I think I've said that a number of times. Things are going to go wrong while you're doing this. Have a plan. Don't let it fluster you. And then, oh yes, when a failure happens for anybody, the first thing you want to do is put an, uh, just a plain hopper in the way. Push the module out of the way and get a hopper, take, take up the feed. Because if you're trying to fix it and more balls are accumulating, that does not relax you. It does not make it easier to solve the problem, having extra balls flooding your mechanism. And it also confuses everybody else if suddenly the balls just stop coming. If you have a hopper full of balls, when they ask you where are all the balls, you hand them a hopper. Hopefully they hand you an empty hopper. But you know, have a hopper hand. The first thing when there's a failure is replace it with a hopper. Uh, start by swapping out. Oh yes, and remember, hate the jam, not the builder. Particularly when my stuff is jamming. But they're all going to fail. There are no ball contraptions that don't have failures, except for the ones in videos. And I, I, I can't prove that they were all one take videos, but all ball contraptions are gonna fail. It's okay, it's, I won't say it's part of the fun, but it's part of the satisfaction of clearing them. So it's not, you know, when someone has a lot of jams, then we can make fun of them. But in a good nature way, these are ways we should solve your problem. Perhaps the way we think we should solve your problem is replace you with a ramp and then you come back next year. But, you know, we're all people, we're all here to have fun, you know, if the public's not seeing a giant spectacle right now, well, they could build ball contraptions and do better next year. Uh, yes, tools to bring. Um, oh, can you pass into poker? A poker. Your fingers are not this long and this skinny, I think. I mean, I'm not judging. But this can reach places you can't reach. I will say as an addition, most of the time, if there are balls inside a mechanism, don't go there. Wait until the end of the show. We, we have plenty of balls to run around. You think you can get in there and not break anything. You are fallible. They are fragile. It's not a good combination, particularly if it's somebody else's module. Um, I have seen beautiful three-foot high wheels that you almost could get under, and someone trying to be helpful went under. And they felt bad, and luckily the builder was a good sport, but that model was out of the loop for the rest of the show because it fell over. And fragile, falling, Lego, we know how this works. It was not refixable in the time frame. So be sure you can, you know, better leave it. And if it is yours, you know, know some ways to fix it. Fix it when something else upstream is jammed so you can turn it off. Spare hoppers, like we were saying, you always want a spare hopper around so that when your module fails, you swap your module for the human GBC pair of hoppers going around. I like fatigue mats. The carpet here is nicer than bare concrete, but something to soften your feet, because this is, not, this is not castle. You're not sitting on a chair. You can't just go wander away and be comfortable. You're going to be spending a lot of time behind the fence dealing with the ball contraptions. You're going to spend a lot of time on your feet. Might as well be comfortable. And comfortable chairs, yes. Um, if you have a favorite folding comfortable chair, you should probably bring it. I have some camp chairs. They're not my better favorite comfortable ones, but they're better than no chairs, which sometimes happens. So just remember, you are an organic creature. You're going to have these problems, you know, the water bottle and everything else. But these are, ball contraption is different than other themes. Many of us are trapped 
enjoying our time behind the table monitoring things for hours at a time in a way that other themes don't have to worry about. So make it easier for you to manage things, make it easier for you to deal with problems, make it easier for you to be comfortable while none of these things are happening, you're sitting there smug watching other folks behind the loop have these problems. What it's gonna take to be popular with the public? Sadly, mechanical excellence and everything I talked about in the ideal situation, only the second point, well no, the first two points, reliable. The public doesn't like things that are broken. The public also doesn't, or does like things that are beautiful. So if it's working and it's beautiful, people like minifigs. I, I don't care that much, I like mechanical stuff, but you know, I'm building for me, I'm not building for the folks on the other side of the table so much. If you wanna be popular with the crowd, minifigs, making it beautiful, Jeff's cracking a tax module. It is now much more mechanically advanced than it was the first year. But the first year it was fantastically beautiful, everybody loved it, because it was beautiful. Wouldn't in doubt be beautiful. Be beautiful and functional, but be beautiful. People love balls in motion. You will be amazed at the amount of gla glazed eye stares you will get from children. You know, bring your conveyor belt up to two feet high, and then have nice little gentle incline ramps going back and forth. Really easy to build, and they will just stare at that. I will slay for 40 hours on a mechanical monster piece that has millions of gears and doing all sorts of stuff. Nobody cares. Or the children don't care, I care. Other ball contraption people care. Balls, visible balls in motion. A little bit of obscurity in your mechanisms. That's like, like people should have to stare at it for not more than two minutes. Like they don't want to stump the public, but if they have an aha moment, that will make you more popular. And make it bigger. Like I said, Thomas Mueller impressed like nobody else did just by a conveyor belt, very simple conveyor belt, but it was six feet tall on top of a table. Yeah, it drew eyes. So this is what the people want in my experience. And then, yes, useful resources besides awesome talks at conventions. The internet is full of them now, it's fantastic. So like I said, I'll publish this, but you know, go onto Google and search for great ball contraption. You'll see lots of really cool ball contraptions. I strongly recommend, uh, Great Ball Pit, yes. Uh, Matt Norman of Canada, up at BrickCon, started the Great Ball Pit, which is an okay website. He's got children now, so strangely he has other things to do besides ball contraption. But he made a Discord for ball contraption. And that is, I think, the best resource right now on the internet for ball contraption problems. So you show up, you know, I think you got a link for his blog, or show up in the entry channel for his Discord. There's a link on the Great Ball Pit website for it. And you can say, here's a little 30 second video of my ball, my ball contraption that spits balls on Thursdays. And literally people all, all, all around the world, Australians and Germans and Americans and everyone else, some of them will be like, oh yeah, yeah, the Thursday problem. We had one, of the, I, I knew a guy, I'll talk to him about how he solved this Thursday problem a couple years ago. It's just a helpful community of folks who are into feeling your pain and that's the joy of the internet. You can find all of them. And that goes back to all the other, you know, places or directions of these. I think you've all heard of BrickLink because you ran out of these parts because they're obscure for your particular mechanism. Um, the Lego Technic Idea Book, Simple Machines. How to do all your, uh, you know, how to turn power at a right angle, how to make things go faster or slower, or a lot faster or a lot slower. It's a great, very great resource. A gear placement, this is something that we're talking about a little longer. When you're just messing around with gears and you don't know what you're doing, which frankly I still don't, there's a lot of ways to get the gears almost right, and you, know, you can turn them by hand and they're mostly working, don't do that. That is, the, down that road lies madness, because they're not gonna work for a show. They're not gonna work for three hours. Something's gonna be loose there, it's gonna skip teeth, it's painfulness. And there is awkward math without using Technic bricks or lift arms for the math. There's this Polish fellow, goes on internet of cereal, he has a website that'll both tell you your gear ratios, but also tell you if I need to move power from, you know, this pole, I have an axle here and an axle here. I want to move the power between them. What are the gear combinations I can get there? And that might make it go faster. It might make it go slower. You can deal with that with other gears, but just knowing this is the solid link to make. The gears are supposed to mesh at these distances. That supposed is not a suggestion. It's really important. It doesn't look like it's important, and you can fake things for a while, but it is a bad plan to fake it. If you know for sure, if you can do the math, and there is math that you can do at home instead of having to let someone else do it for you. I still don't know it, because I found this website a long time ago. And uh, he actually has an app for it, but it's Android only, so I don't care. But yes, I, I can't recommend enough. Get your gear placement down 
solidly by using internet resource or doing the math because otherwise it will be an unpredictable source of pain that's hard for anyone else to diagnose because you're gonna look at it and it looks fine because it looked fine to you at home. No one else is gonna be able to look at it. Not no one else. There's a lot of people with distinct talents in our community. There are people who could look at it and tell you, oh no, those gears don't mesh at that placement. I won't help you that way. So yes, useful resources, the internet's full of them. Go back to, you know, great ball pit and wine and hope someone will help you. And yes, that's my whole slide. Yeah, that's pretty much everything. Questions? Into the mic so that the remote people can hear. As an alternative to the three directional entrance, would the ability to like rotate the exit also work for corners? A pivotable output is also good. Yes. I mean, if you had an output on a funnel that you could pivot or a flexible ramp, there's a famous Akiyuki piece that John's got some examples of. There's actually question one of two. Oh. My other question was, would it make sense to like put a little booklet with some of the more common problems and just if they have simple solutions to help prevent people from accidentally breaking stuff? Like if, like if arm stop, tap, push here to make it start moving again? Like human memory can be somewhat <laughs> un unreliable, so they might not tell you everyth everything you uh, told them. You uh, might just tell them about the book and, and tell them to reference it before they do anything. That's a good theory, and I can agree that in theory that would be useful. Um, in pre like, if you could do it on one index card in a large font, and that literally attach it to the back of the module that says, if jam, press the red lever. Anything more complicated than that is going to be hard to access at the time. It's a high stress environment. There are almost always when problems happen, there are dozens of people staring at you, and you're already tired, and you're like suddenly discovering a problem. It's not a great moment to say, oh, yeah, I'll just go check the index. Or worse, there'll be someone there who doesn't know about your book because most of us don't have books. So it's not a bad idea, but it's much better to have, you know, talk to your two, the neighbors on either side of you. So, you know, you're downstream of Kevin, you're upstream of John. Say, I have this book. These are the things that are going to go wrong with it. I'm going to run off to the men's room. You know, you have it. But a human conversation is the safest way to make sure they have the information. Because otherwise, you know, if you leave the book behind and you hope that's going to work, you're going to go off to be biological and I'm going to be like, oh my God, it's all. Yeah, but I mean, and the other thing that makes me worrisome about a book, if you have a book's worth of problems, <laughs> I know, no, but yeah, a couple of pages, but yes, uh, in theory, a, a list of the things that can go wrong is very useful in practice. I would prefer to have it as a conversation shared among everyone, but a book, the, the, the list is better than nothing. If you have a list, by all means, bring it. Anyone else? So I was just wondering, like, how do you join and bring your own modules? Is there, like, someone we have to contact for that? Uh, just the joy of the, con if, if you are meeting the standard, just register your mock for the convention. We are co-theme coordinators, because but John did pretty much all the work. We looked at the spreadsheet of who had how much distance to cover. I signed up for six feet worth, you know, I don't know if you said six feet also. Someone else wants 10 feet, someone else wants, you know, 32 studs. That's all you have to do, and then we'll figure out a way to lay it all out. And if you are meeting the standard, everything just works. And for the most part, usually, everything just works. We have no planning other than we all meet the standard. We spend a little bit of time on the junctions and where the tables don't quite match up. And yeah, so there, there, it, it is, when everything is good, and it usually is good enough, it just works. And if it isn't quite working, there are usually experienced folks there who can help you get there. but. Sign up for your module. Say, I brought, I'm trying to bring two feet of modules. It helps if you put out first time, you know, then we might have, we might change where we put you, and it might, but no, it's, the whole joy of the standard is very little planning is required. I mean, it's, actually, I have no idea how train and castle all those hooks with the giant combined displays. I know they have a mills standard, but there might be more planning. There might not, I don't know. It's not my problem. I'm a ball contraption problems. So if you do bring your own power source or power, you know, motor and such. Is there usually plenty of access to the plug sockets? Do you have the extension cords or do we need to also bring that? Also bring that. This year is fantastic. The power drops at BrickCon this year, I don't know who to praise for that. Maybe it's just the Maiden Bower Center. This is the best power, that was you? All right, well, frequently like power drops will be every 20 feet or something. So part of my convention kit right now is a 50 foot extension cord and a power strip and I can do all of my stuff off of that. 
as an extra little note of cool things to get, have your power strip and some one foot extension cords because the wall warts will fill up your power strip very quickly, the warts that go with the, the train controllers, but so you can't fill up the plugs, but if the little one foot extension cords, you can. It looks like a mess, but it's a handy thing. So in theory, if you showed up without extension cords and everything else, someone can help you. In practice, it's better not to need help. Then do you bring your own balls at a show or do you keep your own at home and use only the show's balls? All the conventions in the Pacific Northwest, so Brick Can, Brick Con, and Brick's Cascade, the conventions supply balls, which works out really well. I also always bring balls because it could be that I arrived on the scene before the convention balls do and I want to test my setup, but it's so much better. And like, I, I haven't been to Brick, there, there are other conventions that I don't know that have this policy. But if you are in charge of one of those conventions, I strongly encourage you to, if not have the convention supply the balls, have one person supply the balls. Because that just makes it so much easier to clean up at the end. If you're trying to say, okay, well, I brought 37 balls, but the total count is down eight balls out of the 400 we put into the loop. So what is my fraction of the lossage? Don't worry about it. The convention, I mean, maybe you're traveling far. I don't know what Brick World does. I don't know what those other places do. I think most conventions are... Has anyone here been to a ball contraption convention that didn't supply balls? Neil. So they're probably planning to do it some, again sometime in the future. <laughs> That's how you could get started. Just go find those. <laughs> Just repeating that for online. As theme coordinators at BrickCon, we, we, it's OK to use your own balls for some brief testing. But we really prefer all the balls be convention balls. Because like I said, if there's any balls out there at the end of the convention, we're gonna to try to bring them back to BrickCon. So if you had 30 balls in the world and you put them in the loop and you come back after cleanup and all the balls are gone, we're so sorry. <laughs> Officially, as a BrickCon position, we're so sorry. Personally, we will be making... No, no. I noticed that uh, the motor that was supplying power to your chain of, of modules mm -hmm had uh, the gears doubled up. Why is that? The theory on that is that by doubling up the gears, I was reducing the wear. In practice, it didn't matter. I got contraptions that had double gears and single gears. They both generate awesome amounts of powder at the end of the day. Not a measurable difference between the two of them. In theory, two gears will wear less, right? Because they're having to push less. In practice, theory and practice are, no. <laughs> All right. If I have my shared power thing as a personal example up front, if you want to come by after the talk, I will show it to you. If I were to hold it up right now, like Alex is doing, you won't see anything anyway. The slide was better. KevinMitchum.com, come around to the ball contraption. I'll have business cards. I forgot to bring those up here today. Go to Great Ball Pit. That's just the better source anyway. All right, thank you very much.